Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome. Come on in, find yourself a spot. We'll need you to help us lift up these songs to the Lord. Come on in. Welcome to the new life. Um, we are going to start with a song called Before the Throne of God Above. I think probably most of you know it, so uh, let's start with that one today. You're, if you can stand, stand up and join us. morning. Thank you for being here with us as we gather to honor and, and consider and learn about uh, Jesus Christ and grow in him. Would you grab your bulletin, please? I want to highlight a few announcements this morning. Every once in a while, uh, Linnell and I in the church office will uh, get to laughing and joking together about the announcement situation in the bulletin. And there are weeks where we are just barely able to put together a full page, and then there are weeks where it is just massive overhaul and bursting at the seams, and that is one of those weeks. We have a lot in the bulletin this week. I'm going to just very briefly touch on a couple things, but this is our way. We currently use the bulletin in a way to communicate with you important things, so would you please... Uh, take time to read through each of these. Let me just mention a few. First of all, tonight we have uh, our school prayer walk, okay? That begins at 6 o'clock at the elementary, uh, praying at the three schools here at SDC. Our local mission team is leading that, and uh, we would love to have you join us. Combined Sunday school next week, please note that, uh, teachers and parents, and I just want to express to all of you we're going to take time next Sunday morning, that hour, that Sunday school hour, to hear from Reagan Toll and James Brandt on their summer ministries, as well as possibly some of our kids that went to summer camp. So you will want to join us, I hope, at 9.30 next Sunday. And then lastly, I just want to touch on the two inserts, okay? First of all, our elder nomination process is beginning. You'll remember that last year we started doing this earlier in the year because our annual meeting is now in December. And believe it or not, we are at that time of year already again. We have done our best to be uh, good in terms of clear communication on this flyer. It is two-sided. Please read through it carefully. I'll highlight it in the weeks to come. But uh, for this morning, I think the main thing I want to highlight is that the nomination names are due on September 11th, okay? Sunday the 11th. So that's just, what, about three weeks away? 
So please begin to pray about that process. There is a list of current uh, church members on the table out there. You will want to reference that as well. And then finally, this flyer is about our student ministry meals, and we're at that time of year again as well. Our youth ministry on Wednesday evenings will start on September 7th, and we're doing something different this year. You guys have always uh, been so good to support the youth ministry in this way. Uh, previous to this year, it's just kind of been provide the full meal, and that's the option. Providing some more options this year, okay? You can still provide the full meal. You can team up with someone. You can just provide a side dish, a main dish. Read through that. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. And uh, no sign-up sheet this year. If you would just see Amy Brandt, she's going to help walk through the different options with you and the different dates that are available. All right? Jim, would you come forward, please? Uh, that finishes our announcements, and Jim is going to transition us to looking at the Word, to prayer, before we continue to sing. Thank you, Jim. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. This morning, I'm opening in 2 Peter, all of chapter 3. So, 2 Peter, chapter 3. My uh, title on that is The Day of the Lord. And uh, so we'll start there. D Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I have written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. First of all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of the water and by water. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with the roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters can contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. Therefore, dear friends, since you already know this, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of lawless men and fall from your secure position but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 
To him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as, we're, as we gather here before you this morning, just reading these words of, of the truth of Scripture, um, everything that you started, the, the creation, the, you are in control. We, and, you, and you have placed us here at this time to glorify you in this. So, Father, I, I just pray this morning that all of us here take to heart what these words say, to be, to live our lives in holiness, to, to just, you know, come, up, come along beside a, another, another person in need and to just extend you know, the grace of God to them. Help, help, Father, just help us in this way. Show us, show us the mercy and grace to us that we can extend to them. And as, and as we worship you in our, in the songs we sing, and then again as Pastor opens up Scripture, just we just want to give you the glory because you are w w without you we are nothing because we, we think we thank you Jesus for well, what you did on the cross you rose from the dead because we want to know you and the power that's in your re resurrection and so father for for this day and and every day forward just Keep our, that we keep our minds focused on you, our eyes fixed on Jesus. So thank you, Father, in your name. Amen. All right, let's stand again and start by singing Cornerstone. <clears throat>
mystery of mysteries that God would make for me. A place within his family, the once his enemy, a judge of every sinner, and Christ to Calvary, to prepare a place for me. Judgment should be given for this guilt upon my head, but the Father of all glory crushed his Son instead. Now I've been adopted, for God made this to me. You prepared a place for me. Blessed be, blessed be, my God and Savior, you've shown me favor and prepared. I will be able to join the Jubilee. You prepared a place for me. Blessed be, blessed be, my God and Savior, you show of weeks ago when we were 
doing our uh, trolley tour of Savannah, Georgia on family vacation. One of the most interesting places that was pointed out to us was an old church called the Second African Baptist Church. Uh, in a moment here, you'll see a picture of our, our boys on the left looking at that. And uh, then on the right, you will see uh, a better picture than I was able to get from the internet. There you go, the Second African Baptist Church. In the Civil War, when Union General William Tecumseh Sherman made his famous march to the sea, he ended up in Savannah. He took his headquarters there and read the Emancipation Proclamation to African-American citizens of Savannah on the steps of that church. Almost exactly 100 years later, a man named Dr. Martin Luther King filled the pulpit of that same church. And on that day, he read a speech that he was working on to deliver a little bit later in Washington, D.C., that, of course, was his I Have a Dream speech. What an amazing link in history with that one church, the Second African Baptist Church in Savannah. The fact that we saw that place a few weeks ago got me thinking this week about one of my favorite stories and accounts from the Civil War, which also involves General Sherman, who you will see on the left there. William Tecumseh Sherman eventually died in New York City at the age of 71 in February of 1891. Among the pallbearers at his funeral was the guy on the right, 82-year-old by that time, 82-year-old Joe Johnston, who had been on the opposite side of the war. He was a Confederate general who actually fought Sherman multiple times in Georgia and the Carolinas. But now here stands Joe Johnston in the freezing February temperatures of New York City at Sherman's funeral as a pallbearer. When Johnston removed his hat at the funeral in honor of his friend Sherman, Another person, another friend next to him said, Joe, you need to put your hat back on. You are going to fall ill and um, uh, fall ill from this weather. But Johnston refused. He was resolved to keep his hat off in honor of his friend. He said, quote, if I were in Sherman's place and he were standing here in mine, he would not put his hat on. He kept it off. He contracted pneumonia and died 10 days later after the funeral. Isn't that a remarkable story on, on several different levels? A friendship that, that surpassed war and fighting against one another, and a friendship that was loyal to the end, even at great personal cost. One way that we could view our study today in God's Word, one way we could look at it is that it is on friendship. Who's influencing you? Who are you looking towards as an example in your life? Who are you running with? Last week, Paul used the metaphor of running to describe the Christian life. He gave us two key mindsets that the believers should run with, I have not arrived, and I am pursuing Christ, enduring as a runner, pursuing the prize of Christ. Today in our study, though the specific language of running is not there, the metaphor, I think, can be carried over to the idea of being careful who you run with. Find your way to Philippians chapter 3 if you are not there already. We will pray here in just one second, and then we will read the text together, which is shorter for today. Uh, find your way to Philippians chapter 3, and we will be covering verse 17 through verse 21. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the text that is before us. 
these beautiful words of Paul. We pray that you would, um, Holy Spirit, take the word, challenge each heart here towards salvation for those who do not know you, towards the building up of your body for those who do, for those who are in Christ. Lord, open our eyes and, and challenge us concerning the examples we look to in our lives. Father, it's been a few weeks since I've prayed for uh, the box that is behind me in this exercise that we are doing this year of just submitting names that, that we are praying for this year to come to know Christ. Could be family members, could be co-workers, could be a friend. Father, you know who's in there, you know who is on the hearts of your people that that maybe is not in that box, and I, I pray that you would um, bring those people to salvation in Christ according to your will. Father, give us opportunities, as I've already even just recently heard of opportunities with some of these individuals to build relationships with them, to present the glorious gospel, the good news of Jesus to them. And we ask this in that name of Jesus. Amen. All right, find 317, would you please? And let's just take a moment briefly here to read our text together. Philippians 317, Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, Many walk as enemies of the cross. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. We're going to do something a bit different today. Paul contrasts two groups in these verses. We're going to skip verse 17 and get right to that contrast of the groups. And then we will circle back to verse 17 where this key idea comes out concerning friendship concerning example, concerning influence and who you are running with and the people in your life. Let's start with the first part of the contrast, group number one in the text. We will call them the enemies of the cross. The enemies of the cross, group number one. Look at verse 18 again. For many of whom I've often talked to you about, Paul says, and even now tell you again with tears, walk as enemies of the cross. Now, one of the key questions of this text, and I would say even indeed of the whole book, is who are these individuals? Who are these enemies of the cross? And the answer is, to be honest with you, we don't know for sure. We do, however, have, uh, excuse me, have a couple of educated guesses, and biblical scholars seem to go back and forth a bit on which they think it is. Let me share those with you. There's just two. First of all, Paul could be referring to the Judaizers, the Judaizers. We've already encountered them in our study back in verse 2 of chapter 3. These were individuals who were following Paul around on his missionary journeys. Paul would establish a church, a group of believers in a certain city, and then after he left, the Judaizers would sweep in, they would try to get the Gentile converts to start submitting to Jewish religious customs, especially, most often it seems, circumcision. And that was the case in the early part of chapter 3, as we have already, start, uh, already studied. They were a very, very dangerous group of people because they were perverting the gospel of Jesus Christ, the true message of salvation by the grace of God alone through faith alone in Christ. So Paul could be referring to the Judaizers. It would seem to fit the fact that they've already been brought up in the same chapter. However, secondly, scholars point to the option of a group that I am going to call the indulgers. The indulgers. 
quite on the opposite end of the spectrum from the Judaizers. The indulgers were those who operated according to their own senses, their own passions, their own lusts, and sinful desires. Their lives were about promoting and indulging in the next urge, the next desire, the next passion, the next thing that makes them feel good and satisfies their flesh. Listen, please. They may have appeared to be a follower of Jesus. They may have been hanging around the things of God, but their lives show that they are more focused on fleshly matters than spiritual matters. So that could be who we're talking about, the indulgers. Now, I will share in a minute here which of those two I think is more uh, more likely, but for now just note these are the two common suggestions that are given to us. Judaizers, or the indulgers. What might help us in that question of identity is how Paul describes them in the text. How does he describe them? He describes them in five ways. Jot them down in your notes, though there's no blanks connected with them. You might want to jot these down. Take a look at them with me. First of all, in 18, they are enemies of the cross. Quite a statement. Enemies of the cross. The cross of Jesus Christ represents the truth of salvation for mankind, Salvation from sin and eternal damnation through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. His death on that cross paid my debt of sin that I could never repay before God. And by trusting in his death, that is my only way of being forgiven. That cross represents... And whether they are Judaizers or indulgers, either way, that cross represented something that they were an enemy of. If they are Judaizers, they're trying to add physical works to salvation. If they are indulgers, the the lifestyle they promote mocks the cross. That's not what people saved by the cross are supposed to be about. Either way, They're enemies of the cross. Number two, verse 19, their end is destruction. Do you see that? Their end is destruction. This, to me, is the most interesting of the five descriptions, though it's maybe not the best one to summarize this group. The road for this group ends with destruction. That's where their lives are leading. Now, we need to look at that word, I think. That word destruction is the Greek word apolia, apolia. It carries the idea of waste or lostness. One of the disciples used the word in Mark 14.4. He said, Mary, you, you should not waste, there's the word, you should not waste your perfume to anoint Jesus. We could have sold it and used the money and given it to the poor. Do you remember? Waste. Same word, waste, lostness, destruction here. One author said it's the New Testament word for eternal loss. Eternal loss. It's on the opposite end of the spectrum from salvation and eternal life in Jesus Christ. The end of this group is eternal destruction, loss, waste. So what does that tell us about this group? It tells us, it sure seems to me, that they are not believers. Uh, Whatever they appear to be, since we are told their end is destruction, they are not born-again followers of Jesus Christ. Now, one last thought on this description, number two. Back to that word, apolia. has a very interesting couple of ties to Judas. To Judas. Iscariot, the disciple who betrayed Jesus. For, you see, it was Judas who said those words a moment ago. Remember? Mary, you should not waste that perfume. That was Judas saying that. Of course, John tells us Judas wanted to sell it to the poor, or sell it and use the money for the poor, but he really wanted to keep it for himself. But also, the word is used by Jesus to describe. Judas. Do you remember John 17, 12, Jesus says Judas is the son of destruction, or you may have grown up hearing it, the son of perdition. Same word. 
Apollea, son of waste, son of destruction. A couple of really interesting ties to Judas, and I will come back to that thought in a moment. Third description of this group, verse 19, their God is their belly. What an interesting one. Now, some see this as, okay, if this is the Judaizers that are in view here, maybe it's a reference to them pushing Jewish dietary laws onto converts. That may be. If it's the indulgers, the idea is pretty simple, folks. It's a metaphor here. Their God has become whatever satisfies them, whatever fills their stomach, so to speak. In other words, they worship pleasure. Paul is saying the God that this group follows is what feels good to them. Do you hear this message around you today at all? (laughs) McDonald's, I don't know if these are updated slogans, but McDonald's in the past has told us, have it your way. Wendy's has told us, do what tastes right. I drank a Dr. Pepper some time ago now, which is my favorite, and the can said on it, you deserve this. And I thought, yeah, I do. (laughs) You go to Raising Cane's Restaurant, another one of my favorites, and right on every location wall, and I've been to several, it has a little mural that says, eat and be happy. Listen, folks, that that message is all around us, isn't it? We could go on and on and on with examples. Let your God be whatever makes you feel good, whatever satisfies your fleshly desires of hunger or sex or comfort or power, significance, greed, and then, then the list goes on. That's this group right here. Their God is their belly. Number four, verse 19, they glory in their shame. Do you see it? This one's pretty simple. What they do should cause them shame, but they actually glory in it. Their actions in reality are shameful before a holy God, but to them it's their glory, it's their focus, what they seek after, what they love to fulfill. They glory in their shame. And then finally, number five, verse 19, their minds are set on earthly things. About this fifth one, this last description, Gordon Fee, I think, rightly says, quote, this is where we have been heading the whole time. This last one, number five. This is where we've been heading the whole time. Listen, folks, these four previous descriptions all lead to this last one, which summarizes it very well. Their minds are set on earthly things. Those in this group cannot see the value of things beyond this earth. They have their minds completely focused on the here and now. They are so set on earthly things and moving from one form of pleasure to the next that they don't see any value of spiritual matters, certainly no value of eternity. There's no vision for it at all to live life to store up for yourself treasure in heaven, which are words of Jesus that fit well with our discussion. Their minds are set on this earth. So that's this first group, folks, uh, of the contrast that we are looking at today. Five descriptions of who they are. We've noted the question of their identity, but let's end with perhaps a bit more resolution to that question now that we've seen the description. Let me cut to the chase and tell you that I think the better of the two options is to see this group as the indulgers. I think that's the better of the two. I think the the God being their belly and their mind set on earthly things just fits better with the idea of indulgers. They are clearly not believers because their end is destruction. But listen, scholars note, and I agree, it, it is very likely that in some way they were around the church in Philippi. Hence the need for Paul to warn them about this group. In fact, Gordon Fee puts out an idea that I, ha- I like. He suggests that since Philippi was such a major crossroads in terms of travel, 
he thinks that Paul is warning the Philippian believers about people who are not a part of their regular church or even community, but in fact they may be people who would be traveling through the city identifying themselves as Christians or hanging around the church during their time there, and yet their lives are lives of indulgence and sin, and in reality, they're not in Christ at all. By the way, I think that fits really well with the couple of ties we noted with Judas. Is it possible that Paul is intentionally using that word, apolia, and and those ties. Judas said Mary was wasting her perfume. Jesus calls Judas the son of waste, the son of destruction. And now Paul uses the same word to describe the end of this group, waste, destruction. Is it possible that like Judas, this group seems like they believe They go through the religious motions, and yet in reality, they are non-believers who promote sinful behavior. Listen, folks, I'm just tossing out the idea that I like best. In reality, we don't know exactly who this group is. Perhaps it is Judaizers, perhaps it's indulgers. But listen, please, whichever the case, focus on the description of this group. This is who we're talking about. Their God is their belly. They glory in shameful things. They ultimately are enemies of the cross. They are destined for eternal punishment. Listen, in short, this is what I would call them. Even above indulgers, they are citizens of the earth. They are citizens of the earth. Their minds are set on this earth, this life, this pleasure that I can pursue to fill my stomach. Citizens of earth. That's group number one. Let's move on to the other part of the contrast. Group number two, we will call them not citizens of earth, but citizens of heaven. Look at verse 20 again. But, contrast, right? But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies to be like His glorious body, by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself. And so, folks, after several weeks in the book of Philippians, we have come to the verse that captures the title of our series that I chose, Alien Living. It is a title from this very verse. We are citizens not of the earth, but of That word citizenship is the Greek word polytuma, polytuma. You can hear it in there. It's where we get our word politics from. The word can mean conversation. It can mean the administration of civil affairs or the state or the commonwealth. Here it carries the idea of citizenship, that place where we are a part of, that place where we have official status that place where one's name is recorded on the register of citizens. It's the only time in the entire New Testament that this word is used right here in verse 20. However, there's a verb form of this same word, and it's used in this very book back in 127. You might remember we noted this. Here's 127. Only let your manner of life, citizenship, Be worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That phrase, your manner of life, is the word polytumai, the the verb form of this word in our text. I said it back then when we looked at 127. I say it again now. This is a key theme of the book we're studying. Born again followers of Jesus Christ are aliens on this earth. Paul says here, our citizenship is in another place, heaven. Bring in 127, and he's saying there that there is an obligation, therefore, that your behavior be worthy of the gospel. That as aliens, your life matches not what the first group looks like, citizens of earth, but it matches what your true identity is, a citizen of heaven. The idea of citizenship was especially meaningful to the Philippians, as we have noted already in our study 
city of Philippi was an official Roman colony. It meant uh, that if you, were, uh, if you lived in Philippi, you were actually a Roman citizen. Remember, Philippi is in Greece, but you're a citizen of a place in Rome, uh, uh, Italy, excuse me. You were therefore protected by the laws of Rome. You received the privileges of Rome, though many of them had never been to Rome. Yet they are official citizens there with all the rights and privileges of those who do live in Italy, in Rome. And so when Paul throws out this language of being citizens of heaven, this is an idea that the original audience would have understood well. The idea, listen, that you live in one place but are actually a citizen of another place, a faraway country, city. They got it. They understood what that meant. And Paul says here, listen, born again, follower of Jesus, you are in reality a citizen of heaven. So what does that mean? Where Paul goes with that is found in the second part of verse 20 and then into 21. What it means that the difference it makes is that in contrast to the first group, we don't have our mind set on earthly things. The believer, the citizen of heaven, has their focus set on the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, we have our mindset. We eagerly anticipate, he says, the return of the King, the Lord Jesus, verse 20. We are choosing to live our lives with the reality in mind that Christ is returning again to judge the living and the dead. I'm living my life to please Him, not the moment-by-moment indulgence of my sinful desires. That's where my citizenship lies, and so that is what is going to govern my life. You see the contrast here with the first group? It's it's night and day. The citizen of earth is lord to themselves and their belly, pleasing themselves. The citizen of heaven is under the Lord Jesus. Now, before we wrap up, just in case you're wondering which group is better to be a part of, (laughs) don't miss verse 21. Great verse. Citizens of heaven at the appearing of Jesus again will have their broken, lowly body transformed into one that is like that of the resurrected Jesus. What a contrast. The first group is is bound for apolia, waste, destruction. The citizen of heaven is bound for heaven in a brand new body. When thinking of this verse, I think it's always fun to consider the resurrected body of Jesus, isn't it? It says here, our bodies will be transformed into the likeness of his glorious body. And so what do we know of his resurrected body? John MacArthur provides a helpful little list for us. Number one, we know that his body, his resurrected body of Jesus was recognizable to the disciples. Secondly, we know that he was able to talk and eat and walk with them, that there's a physical component to it. And yet, number three, we know that it was not limited by the physical component constraints that we have now. Why do we say that? It seems that he appears and disappears at will. It seems, some think, that there's an indication that he's entering a room with locked doors after his resurrection. We're not given a long list of what Jesus' resurrected body was like, but we do have those hints and descriptions. Bottom line, This lowly body, which goes from one pain to another, broken bones. Amy and I were doing some yard work this weekend and kind of reorganizing our shed a little bit. And there in the corner, a beautiful keepsake of mine is my old cast from when I broke my arm. In third grade, it's gross. I mean, why in the world I still have that? I don't know. But broken bones. I'm the only one that appreciates my old cast. My old cast. Broken bones, scraped knees, arthritis, sciatica. 
These lowly bodies so wrecked by disease and illness, fevers, stomach flu, bronchitis, diabetes, Alzheimer's, cancer. This lowly body that wastes away and we fight so hard to prevent that and spend so much time and, and money to maintain. And yet it, it wastes away. But these lowly bodies will be for the citizen of heaven transformed into a body that is fit for eternity with the Lord Jesus. We are through the comparison, folks. We've seen group one, enemies of the cross, citizens of earth who have their minds set on the earth and, and, and filling their stomach one pleasure to another. We've seen group two, the citizen of heaven, who have their minds set on Christ and eternity and pursuit of pleasing Him. However... We have really yet to see the reason why Paul is saying all of this. Why is Paul talking about these two groups? What's his point? I'd like to conclude by circling back now to verse 17. And we'll discover both the example and how we can, obe uh, how we can be obedient to this text. Look at 17 again. <coughs> right at the beginning. Brothers, join in imitating me. And keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us for many. And then he gets into group number one, doesn't he? Write this down, folks. These groups have been put before us for the purpose of example. We have seen these two groups for the purpose of example. This is the main command in this section. Everything else that we've already talked about in these two groups this morning flows out of the command of verse 17. Why are we talking about the indulgers? Why are we talking about being citizen of, uh, citizens of heaven? Because Paul is putting them before the Philippian church and saying, here is who you need not to follow, and here is who you do need to follow and look to and imitate. Listen, yes, take personal inventory, believer, and use this text to evaluate if you are properly living as a citizen of heaven, and if there's any hint of sinful indulgence in your life, yes, do that. But the main idea of this text is not so much personal inventory of yourself, but personal inventory of the people around you. The example in your life. Who are you looking to? Join in imitating me, Paul says. Now, that might sound a bit egotistical to us. It isn't. We remind ourselves of <coughs> 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, pardon me, which is on the screen, where Paul says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ, right? MacArthur puts it this way, Paul urged the Philippians to imitate the way that he lived. He was not putting himself on a pedestal of spiritual perfection. Instead, he was encouraging the Philippians to follow him, an imperfect sinner, as he ran from last week, as he pursued the goal of Christ and Christ-likeness. Imitate me, follow me, as I am running towards Christ. You say, well, what were the Philippians and, and now us? What, what are we supposed to imitate about Paul? And the answer, of course, is in the context around us, right? He's just talked about being a good accountant in chapter 3, 4 through 11. He's, he's daily counting the things of this world as garbage compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. He's just talked about being a runner, in 12 through 16, he has these two mindsets as a runner. I haven't arrived, I'm not there where I need to be, and I'm enduring in my run, pursuing Christ. And now in this text, he says, good citizen, citizen of heaven. He has his mind set on Christ, not the earth. He governs his life according to Christ's desires, not the desires of his sinful flesh. Be an accountant, be an enduring runner, be a citizen of heaven. That's what to imitate in Paul. <clears throat> this is the main emphasis of the text. Brothers and sisters in Philippi, join in imitating me. And yet notice, he's not alone, is he? 
He's not the only one to look to. He brings that out in 17. He says, verse 17, keep your eyes on others who also walk according to this pattern. Some think that he has Timothy and Epaphroditus in mind. We've already seen them brought up as examples to the church in Philippi. I think Paul's idea here goes beyond just those two. Uh, Believer, look to the many around you right now and in history who have walked as a good accountant, who have run as a faithful runner, who live as good citizens of heaven. It's all about the idea of example, believer, and why is that important? Because, listen, he goes on to say then in verse 18 that there are those who are living in a way around you that is not good for you to look to and follow and imitate. Because you have to be very careful who you're running with. Don't look to and get wrapped up in the company of indulgers. There's a danger there in keeping company with those who are not running well, whose God is their belly. As 1 Corinthians 15 says, bad company ruins good morals. Don't get distracted. Don't get off course by looking towards the indulgers. You make sure, believer, that you are running with those who walk according to the example that you have in us, Paul says. So how do we do that? What do we look for? I'd like to end with an attempt at a very practical help. I'd like to walk through, and don't get scared by this number, we're going to go through them very, very quickly. Walk through nine descriptions of one who is running well, one who is living as a faithful citizen of heaven. The main command in our text is to imitate those who are running well in a very real sense It is asking ourselves the question, who am I spending time with? Who are your friends? Who are you running with? Who are you looking towards as examples? Now, please keep in mind a couple of quick things before we dive into this list. Number one, you need to have, and I'm speaking to believers here, you need to have relationships with those who do not know Christ in your life. We just got done in last week maybe or the week before in our adult Sunday school class talking about and emphasizing when it comes to evangelism the importance of relationships. Second, you need to have relationships with those in your life who are young in their journey as a citizen of heaven. If you leave here this morning and and you think in your mind, well, the text is saying that I can only ever spend time with people who are running well. No, 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 no. Listen, please. You, believer, need to have relationships with non-believers and young believers, but the point is you need to have good examples in your life. You need to be really careful, key word here, that the influence upon your life is coming from those who are running well. And you need to be intentional about looking out for, looking to the example of those in your life who are living as faithful citizens of heaven. So what are some of the ways that their lives look like? Let me share with you nine descriptions. Not an exhaustive list, and we're going to move through these quickly, but I hope this is a practical encouragement. Number one, Keep your eyes on those who are indeed citizens of heaven. (laughs) This is a starting point. That is to say, right off the bat here, you know that that person in your life is a born-again follower of Christ. They have trusted in Him for salvation. You hear a testimony of and see evidence of in their lives a love and devotion to Christ. It goes beyond church attendance It goes beyond an occasional reference to spiritual things. It is evident that those who are running well, like Paul in this text, are committed to following the Lord Jesus. Number two, keep your eyes on those whose lives are marked by holiness and a hatred of sin. Holiness and a hatred of sin. This is the opposite of group number one, the indulgers. 
You need to look to those in your life whose God is not their belly. You need to look to those who are faithfully on the screen here living out 1 Peter 2, 1. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles, aliens, to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Notice the link there between the idea of foreign, alien, citizen of heaven, and holiness. Look to those in your life. Run with those whose lives demonstrate an obedience to the word of God and hatred for sin. Listen, they're not perfect. They're not sinless. But they rightly recognize the damage that sin causes, and they hate it, and they wrestle with it, and they strive to put it off in their lives. Number three, look to those whose lives are governed by the word. I would put a star by this one. This one is important. And it brings in the idea of citizenship, perhaps a little clearer. Whose lives are governed by the word. This is to say, folks, when it comes to their parenting, uh, these runners are, are looking to God's word for the authority on parenting. When it comes to their marriage, they're looking to the word and not to what their co-workers are saying. When it comes to their sexuality, they're letting the word govern that in their lives and not the latest Netflix program or YouTube personality. When it comes to their fill-in-the-blank work ethic, their, the use of their money, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, their lives are governed by the word and not earthly perspective. Number four. This is a fun one. Look to those who faithfully serve the King of Heaven, who faithfully serve Jesus. Look, for example, believer, in your life of people who are actively serving Christ with their time. As a citizen of Heaven, they're they're spending time actively serving Christ in the church, in the community. Now, I think it's always important to remember this. We're not saying that they kind of just chuck out the window their earthly responsibilities their family, work. We know that if they had that perspective, it's contrary to biblical teaching. But their lives demonstrate a commitment to using their spiritual gifts to serve the king. Number five, look to those who are humble. Look to those who are humble. Folks, with these next four, we are getting specifically into some themes of our book. Okay, would you just bracket that maybe with five through eight? We're getting into specific Philippian stuff. After all, Paul is talking about looking to his example and others who are walking the same way, and and it would seem wise to me to consider the specific things he's addressing in this book about how it looks to run well. And one of the primary thoughts, as we know in this book, we have noted this, is humility. Humility. (coughs) Those who are running well are humble people. Those who are faithful citizens of heaven are humble like Jesus, chapter 2, and Timothy, chapter 2, and Epaphroditus, chapter 2, and Paul in this book. Are you looking towards people in your life, believer, who put others first? Are you spending time with people who are teachable people? And who recognize, like Paul last week, that they haven't arrived. (laughs) And you see in them a hunger for spiritual growth. And to know Christ more intimately. Number six, look to those who have a godly view of suffering. Who have a godly view of suffering. Suffering is a theme in this book. Uh, We have touched on it a bit. Uh, 129 comes to mind, speaks of suffering. Believers, surround yourself with those who have a godly view of suffering and trial and pain. Let me ask you a question. I'm going to give you a second to think about this. If the people in your life are indulgers, okay, what are you going to get from them? What are you going to hear from them in trial? How are they going to respond when things get tough, if they're indulgers? I think you're going to get complaining 
and you're going to get bitterness. You're going to see a, a bitterness of the soul in them. Why? Because if their God is their belly and that now is taken away, that comfort and that pleasure is not there, the result, it seems to me, is complaining and bitterness. But a faithful runner has a godly view of suffering, difficult though that is for all of us. Yet they trust the Lord and they glory in Him and they praise Him in the trial. Number seven, look to those who are content. Isn't this a beautiful word, content? Haven't spent a lot of time on this theme yet in this book, but it's coming. It's coming in the next chapter, the last chapter, chapter four, contentment. What a great word. Believer, look to those, surround yourself with those who are people of contentment. Those who do not let the physical circumstances of this earth affect their joy in the Lord. Number eight, speaking of joy, look to, the, uh, look to those who are joyful, who are joyful. A big part of this book, as we have noted, is the theme of joy. Believers, surround yourself with fellow believers who are displaying a joy that is anchored in the Lord, in the reality of salvation and being in Christ, rather than those who are trying to anchor their joy in the shaky ground of the ever-changing circumstances of this life. Remember that joy is the flag that is flown in the heart when the master is in residence. Remember that illustration from a few weeks ago? That's the kind of people you want to run with who are flying the flag of joy in their life, showing that the master is in, uh, is in residence. Is it possible for a believer... Uh, to fall into the temptation towards a hypercritical spirit and negativity in complaining. It is. I have fallen into that at different seasons. And that's not the example you need to be looking to, believers. Sad as that is, look to those who are flying the flag of joy in the Lord. Finally, as sort of a, a bonus thought, I leave you with number nine, and we close in this way. Number nine, look to those faithful runners in history. In history. We started with some history this morning, General Sherman and Joe Johnston. Look to faithful runners in history. So far to this point, we've been talking about and only talking about those you look to who are alive <laughs> and, and in your life directly. And of course, that's where we need to start with our evaluation. However, when it comes to looking towards godly example, don't forget the great lives of the past. They are a treasure to us. You want to surround yourself with examples of those who have run well? You want to surround yourself with examples of those who have lived as faithful citizens of heaven? Pick up a biography. Watch a documentary. Watch a movie that's based on a real life. Learn about the Amy Carmichaels and the John Wycliffs and the Elizabeth Elliots and the D.L. Moody's and the Johnny Erickson Tata's and, and the list goes on and on and on. Don't neglect the treasure of surrounding yourself with examples from history. All of this, folks, is an attempt to practically see what the text is pointing to. The main command is to look to the examples of Paul and others who are running well and imitate them. Why is that important? Because there are those out there whose lives are not worth imitating. Group one. Instead, Look to those who are running well and who are faithfully living out their citizenship in a faraway country. <laughs> a citizenship in another city. A citizen of heaven. Father, we thank you for the reality of citizenship in heaven for the believer. One author I read this week, as you know, Lord, said, uh, that we live as believers, we live uh, as an outpost 
in a foreign place. What a way to see it that we here in Tama Toledo as, as believers or, or Marshalltown or Belle Plaine, wherever we come from, we live as an, as an outpost for the king, for heaven, for the kingdom of Christ. Father, in, in this text, we see your warning through Paul that look to those who are running well, who are doing the work of an accountant, who are living as faithful citizens of heaven. Don't get wrapped up and distracted by looking to those, I think, in this text, who, who don't even know you and yet who can have an influence on us towards sin. We hold in balance the need to go out and be salt and light and have relationships, of course, with those who know you. We, we recognize that balance. But Father, I, I do pray that you would uh, challenge my heart and, and our hearts uh, by doing uh, not necessarily first and foremost the self-evaluation, but an evaluation of those who are in our lives and perhaps the influence we're allowing them to have. And may that be in line with those who are running well, living as citizens of heaven on this earth, like Paul, like Timothy, like Epaphroditus. We thank you for your word, Lord, and how it is living and active to do its work in our lives. And we stand now and sing this song in praise of our wonderful Savior Jesus. In his name, amen. Amen. Let's stand and close together with this last song. Thank you, Ocean Team. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing all is mine.
until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. All the glory evermore to Him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall ring me, yet not I. complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. What a beautiful song. Thank you, worship team. Wonderful lyrics there. Would you please forgive me and just have a seat for one moment? I, I'm sitting here, and I, I'm so glad the Lord brought this to mind. I totally forgot to pray for our teachers and students this morning. And I want to do that as we try to do each year. And so this will be our closing prayer. But could I have all of our students who are going to be starting school here soon, some this week, some later, would you just come and join me? Who will be the first brave soul that comes up? And then James, all right, come on up. And then, um, <laughs> come on, guys, I see you out there smiling. Yeah, Jack, come on, buddy. And then teachers, would you come up to, please, homeschool, public school? We want to pray for both. Would, would you join me, please, if you are homeschooling your kids? We would love to pray for you. Nate, Patty, Elaine, as you teach in our public schools, would you join me as well? Beth, if you want to join us, you're welcome to. If not, we want to make sure we're praying for Beth Weiss on our school board. And we thank you for serving in that way. Uh, what a great group here. Um, and I, I just jotted down some notes. You know, why, why do we do this? I, we've, I think we've done this every year in our seven years. Uh, number one, the next generation is important to us. You know that if you've been around New Life for a while. 